This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. So I'd like to welcome um, you all and, and Basil. Yeah. Um, David Church is in his own place, so I should welcome myself. But this is the 100th long table, and we're going to have it here from um, the BCD Library uh, in Athens. And um, as we were just told, when it rains, um, the internet goes down. Let's hope it doesn't rain, but it doesn't look so good. So mm. um, no, we'll hope that we'll make it through the hour. Um, I should say that I um, we met uh, a number of years ago, and I won't say a number how many of decades ago. Decades, you, you know, he's <laughs> really reading the, uh, when I first worked in in uh, in this wonderful library um, on a study that I'm still um, trying to finish. As yeah. um, yes, as some people remind me of. Um, but the question here is really. Um, what kind of library this is and this, um, we're going to look at this. And I thought we would start with um, initially just doing a little tour with the iPad and where mm -hmm. I'm going to show you um, physically what it actually looks like. And then going, um, Basil and I are going to have a number of questions, but um, you can ask questions too. I'm, I'm using this on an iPad where I have to sometimes, we don't necessarily see this. So I'm um, please feel to interrupt or Emma, if you just um, let us know someone is there. But so we're gonna maybe just start walking yeah. around. Or we start by walking and not by talking. Yes, I okay. think that way people know what we're talking about. So I'm going to now hopefully <laughs> switch the camera around. All right. Okay. All right, so. And do you want to, maybe you're going to be the talker and ask yeah, the yeah. camera I, person. I, uh, now we're looking at uh, a section, which is a turn, turn left here. All this part is what we call collections. And collections can be anything from um, s &G to a little pamphlet with a few photographs of a private collection. Actually, these are more fun. The private collections are harder to find because they've been printed in small runs and uh, in various weird places all over the world. And uh, uh, they're very useful because they illustrate points that uh, they cannot be found anywhere else illustrated. And um, afterwards, further on, we have a, a section down here at the bottom which we call dictionaries. They're not really dictionaries, but they attempt to uh, do uh, a overview of the whole uh, Greek coinage, like Mione, you have over there, or uh, Babylon here, the famous Traité of Babylon. And uh, of course, this uh, recent contraption of CNG. Yep, Oliver's books. And these are Oliver's book done in a great hurry. And of course, uh, they uh, they could be improved, I hope, in the next edition. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, uh, there's a very small Roman section here, mostly because we had to have them all were donated to the library. And uh, over here, we have an even smaller Byzantine section of general books. Uh, Byzantine, uh, you Byzantinists will recognize this uh, set over here, the Dumbarton Oaks, and then the, uh, uh, for a quick reference on, on Byzantine. Uh, this section is very different to it's nothing to do with points at first glance, but uh, let me read. This part over here is art and antiquities. Uh, on the right-hand side, you start with cult, myth, religion, and then further down, you have um, collecting, any, anything, any book talking about collecting, law, anything that has to do with the law, and forgeries. Further down is literature and a small section of travel. But all these books were bought, not um, 
with no reason. They were bought because they have something to do with coins. Um, without necessarily illustrating coins, people who work on coins can use these books and they can be very useful sometimes because some of them are hard to find and very rare. Then um, we can go to the next room, which is what we call a uh, general reference. <clears throat> Any book that has even one photograph of an ancient coin, uh, the object of the library is to uh, own it. And uh, in this way, you find some very strange books that have, at first glance, nothing to do with coins. Um, mythology and so on. If somebody writes something about mythology, they illustrate it with coins sometimes. And this is the point. These coins can be taken from private collections, which is very interesting, or from well-known collections like the BM. And these, uh, when uh, somebody does a dice study, uh, he needs to record every place where his particular coin was illustrated, not only uh, where he picked it up from, but all the way back to uh, non-numismatic books as well. And uh, there's another big section over here, which we call periodicals. Periodicals can be, as you see from the top, all the ANS stuff. Um, numismatic literature is a periodical, but you have also some periodicals that are extremely useful, like this run over here. You see the, the little markers. These are um, the fixed price lists of Kricheldorf. They are similar, but not the same to the well-known Munzen medallion lists. And I have marked these um, little papers where there are um, forgeries illustrated because uh, the old man Kricheldorf really liked to illustrate all the forgeries he could find. <laughs> some of them are very convincing, some not, of course. And then you go on to... Uh, J-I-A-N and uh, other uh, things that are useful. Uh, and then we start with the uh, uh, Numismatic Chronicle and other uh, periodicals uh, of, uh, of the main museums of, uh, of Europe and the US. Not all of them complete, but uh, again, uh, the accent is on coins of my interest. And these are essentially coins of mainland Greece. Um, another section here is what we call um, um, history and topography. And again, uh, no real coins illustrated there, but to study a particular mint, you certainly need quite a lot of these books and uh, some of them are very hard to find. Then uh, the rest of the, of the room is what I said uh, before, um, anything that has a, a coin photograph, whether it's an off print or a little note somewhere or a big book, these are useful for people who do, who do die studies. Essentially, the um, die study uh, idea was behind the uh, building of this library. It started by just uh, buying books here, there, and everywhere. And then I said, how can these books be useful and to whom? And that was the... Uh, the first step towards the specialization of this library. And uh, it's still specialized because if it wasn't specialized, I would probably need uh, several more apartments for it. <laughs> and, uh, In fact, there's the is, kitchen uh, here. Which is really, uh, as you mm -hmm. see, it's, it's quite full, it's overflowing. We have very little space left. 
So um, uh, from the non-commercial section, which is this, we can move on to the uh, commercial part of the library, which is where most research is done because people who come here are usually um, well versed in the usual materials such as uh, SNGs and all other periodicals that can be found in uh, in most uh, museum libraries and so on. But the uh, catalogs, the auction catalogs and the lists. I think I removed the spotlight. So if Emma could turn that story. on. We can show you the room of uh, American and uh, German. They occupy a whole room. And here we are. Um, the American material starts from A to on and on and on, goes around the corner here. And then uh, it ends somewhere down here with, uh, I think it's superior or something like that at the end. Uh, let's see, yeah. And then we have the German which is again very, very uh, okay. voluminous. Uh, at the end over here, we have a small section of Iberia, which is Portugal and Spain over here. But the rest, all the rest over here is German. Swiss is over here. Over here is Swiss. And uh, then the last, group over there is miscellaneous. It could be Japanese, uh, Hungarian, and all kinds of things. But they're all commercial. That is to say, uh, either a fixed price list or an auction catalog or a bio bid sale or whatever. And uh, it's pretty hard to try and make a complete run of some of these because they are very um, unknown and people used to throw them away when they uh, when they were done with them okay i think that's about it yes and we're leaving out one room that is as large as the one you've just seen but that has poor <laughs> internet connection we see here yeah, in the, the the other room is all the other uh, um, uh, nationalities like so england uh, england and uh, you can turn the light on maybe we'll try it England, France, and Italy, plus Belgium and uh, Holland, and they're all here, all of them commercial. Excellent. So well, they get. That's about and it. And then here. And who sits here? Here comes. Oh, yes. Here we have somebody sitting comfortably, who, uh, <laughs> without whom the library wouldn't exist because she works hard and uh, she uh, does everything that is necessary to keep it going. And her name is Pat. Yes, hi, Mary. Well, I actually, yeah, Pat. Pat, mm -hmm. Pat is well known to most uh, yes. of the, I of the think watchers, so. I think. Um, so this okay. is Pat. <laughs> <laughs> She's uh, solved oh. many problems. Yes, this is the person you usually write to, so. Yes, so I've probably corresponded more with you than seeing you in person. Often. Yeah. So, yeah. But I know some people are out there that have worked here for weeks on end, looking at every <laughs> catalog and every book in the library, Ross, <laughs> <laughs> and enjoy the information gleaned from them. And that's the important part of the library, of course. Um, I have a little bit more intimate knowledge of the placement of the books than Basil does. <laughs> he gave you a cursory, uh, a cursory idea of the position of certain categories and sections and so on. But the main focus of the library really, the strongest part uh, is the, are the auction catalogs, fixed price list, the commercial section. 
of the linear feet that we have, which are about uh, 1700, 1750, uh, more than half of that is in auction catalogs and fixed prices and by bid sales, what we just call generally the commercial section. And that's separated, as Basil pointed out, from the front end of the library to the back. Mm -hmm. So you can work back here as a scholar or a collector here um, and be completely immersed in searching catalogs for weeks on end. We figure it takes about three months to cover everyone. Right. I was, I was going to say that we had a couple of people here working to find the Wattenmünzen illustrated. Right. Ken, yes, yes. And these, uh, these people worked really hard and it took them three months mm -hmm. to go through every single commercial publication that we have in this library looking for specific coin. And it was a couple, it was two people. There were two people. All these. It makes a lot of difference if there are two people because yes. one yep. handles the catalog, the other makes the recording, the photographs, and so on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if, if anybody wants to work here for a dye study, he better have some spare time <laughs> in his uh, yeah. itinerary. Okay. Excellent. So maybe we'll go back and mm -hmm. I hope people could see that and it wasn't too shaky. Right. Now we're going to switch this around. Switch the camera. Yeah, uh, this camera is amazing how it moves and follows us. Yes. Good. So now um, that you've toured us, you know, and this is really, um, you only really get an impression of this when you work here. And I've been very fortunate this summer, I've been here since May. And there's really so much more than one could describe. So the question is I mean, you're famous as a coin collector, but mm -hmm. What prompted you to put together this, this well, list? Well, it's, it's a progression of uh, different stages in someone's life. Uh, when you start collecting, you know nothing about coins and you, you are proceeding empirically. You buy what you like and so on. And after a while, you say to yourself, you can't go on like this. You have to specialize. And specializing helps you to become a kind of an expert because if you if you have uh, a run of uh, 15 uh, drams of pharsalus for instance and suddenly you acquire one more that is said to be uh, very rare and uh, very special and it was uh, uh, found in iran you put it next to the others and you say now to start with this one shouldn't have been found in Iran in this condition. And you realize after comparing it to all the others that it's a forgery. <laughs> and um, this, is, this is how advancing in, uh, in uh, experience happens. Um, with the books, um, if I was lucky enough to have some good contacts in my early 20s and I corresponded with them. Everything was by correspondence then. You couldn't do much else. Uh, um, telephone or anything was useless uh, and so on. Uh, corresponding was uh, the way to get what you wanted. You asked people or you traveled and you looked up in the in the directory uh, in every city you went, and you uh, you found out, uh, for instance, uh, Johann Christian Holm in Copenhagen, <laughs> selling coins, and his shop was in a porno street. Every every other front of 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 this. Um, of this street 
shopping front had uh, uh, naked men and naked women, large posters, um, accessories for sex, all kinds of things. And when I went into, into Holmes shop, I was actually looking for SNGs, the original SNGs. That was in the, in the 60s, early 60s. And uh, I walked in and he said, um, I'm not selling any porno material. I said, I didn't come for that. I came, I came to ask you if you have any volumes of Silogenumorum Grecorum, the Copenhagen. And he said to me, really? You're looking for those? Well, actually I do. And I bought, <laughs> I bought some from him. And then we became very good friends because he somehow wanted to chat with me about Greece and so on. And then uh, it was uh, again uh, my good luck that he had found a very rare um, medieval Danish coin that he wanted to sell to the cabinet, but they didn't have the money. So the cabinet said to, to him, we will exchange with a lot of duplicates that we have that never went into the SNG. And uh, there were boxes and boxes and boxes of Greek bronzes mostly, but some silver also. There were the SNG duplicates. And I was delighted to look at coins of the areas that I was interested in. And I knew there were, there were duplicates of the, of the Copenhagen syllogy. And so I bought quite a lot of those, but um, when I, I put them aside, there were boxes, not just a few coins. And he and Holm and I asked to Mr. Holm, can you give me a price for these? He said, no, you make your own price. I said, well, uh, I will try. And being very um, conscious of the situation, I obviously gave him very high prices or higher than what he expected. <laughs> and, and he was very, very happy. And, uh, and then we became very good friends. And uh, he represented me in the um, Rasmussen sale. And, uh, and generally speaking, you, you build up a, con a, co a connection with these people that had books or um, coins, of course. The other one I remember, I got quite a lot of nice books in the beginning of the library was uh, Mrs. Egelseder. there. She had a company called München and Numismatisches Antiquariat. Hmm. And she sold me the whole set of uh, Navilas Classica annotated with hmm. the names of the buyers or whatever. And other good books, basic books, standard books, standard references. And that went on for some years. And then one day I went to see her in Munich and she was crying. She was crying, literally mm -hmm. crying. And I said, what happened to you? She said, I made somebody a partner and he used some legal means of kicking me out of the company and now I'm without anything I'm going I'm going to leave this place because he owns everything sad story <laughs> and I know who this person is I don't want to tell you but he, he had a very famous library and he's still around and uh, it's a shame uh, that uh, this thing happened because she was a nice lady Anyway, oh, these are stories um, yes, about, <laughs> about books, uh, numismatic books that really don't uh, interest many people. But let me see, I made a note here. Yeah, no, they have these, the, the, the specialist and the generalist, you know, yeah. this is really one of these interesting questions. Yeah, for this collectors. is it. Yeah, this is it. We, is it. We've been then, discussing this now for a little while, but yeah. I mean, this is a specialized library, probably the most specialized I can think of. Yeah. Um, you know, give, give us some idea what, yeah. and it, how it, it works. It, it works. Uh, basically, there are three types of visitors. The first one would be a student. A second one would be a dealer. And the third one would be a real scholar. Now, the students and scholars usually have the same uh, 
objective. The students are trying to create some kind of die study to pass their uh, examination and become a doctor because to be a doctor is very important apparently. And the uh, scholars, <clears throat> the recognized scholars, the famous scholars, uh, also using um, commercial publications to do die studies and uh, learn as much as possible uh, visually from uh, looking at photographs of the coins they're working on. The middle, the middle guy, the dealer, usually comes for different reasons. Uh, or doesn't even come here. He asks questions like, um, I have a reference that I'm not so sure about. It is Kirpfelsius um, and Münzhandler auction two, lot 315. Could you tell me if this is a Mark Antony denarius? And of course we go to this particular catalog that is not easily found elsewhere. And we find out that it isn't a Mark Antony denarius. And then the trouble starts because we say, what could be wrong? The numbering or the volume number? So we take all the, all the numbers of the Kurfeld <laughs> auctions and look at 318 or whatever it was to see if this is it. And if it isn't, then what can you do? Um, you start suspecting that it's what they call a fake reference, which is very fashionable today <laughs> for obvious reasons. You know why. Um, and this is helpful to a dealer because if he's offered a coin with a fake reference, he knows that there's something wrong with the person who's offering it to him. Um, so uh, what else did I write down? Um, Keeping up to date, yeah. That's ah, to keep, to to keep to this date. library up to date is probably 10 times as hard as being a collector of ancient coins because you depend on people sending you their catalogs. And the dealers who issue catalogs don't come up in the same category. You get, I'm afraid to say, you get from the less good dealers, right at the bottom rank of the, of the steps, to the top dealers. The, the dealers that uh, I, I always have problems with are the people who refuse to send you their catalog unless you buy from them. Now, usually the catalogs of these people have only rubbish in them. So if you want to buy, you really have to sacrifice yourself and <laughs> buy rubbish. And uh, this is not very nice because you can offer to them to make a subscription, to offer your subscription. Some people do offer subscriptions and this is quite fair. But there are others who somehow they don't have the ability to, uh, to do it um, logistically. And they are um, what I call a slapdash operation. And these people, unfortunately, uh, are the ones that we need most because their auction catalogs or their lists are less known very uh, small runs, et cetera, et cetera. And yet the library has to have them because even one ancient coin in such a catalog is a reason for the library having to have this catalog. And this is the biggest problem I've had over the decades that I've been trying to uh, do runs of uh, commercial publications, as we call them. We've got this uh, listing here of the different countries when, um, you know, that was just by linear uh, meter or feet, and it's enormous, these quantities. But it was quite fascinating to me to see that, uh, that even today, Germany leads 
leads indeed. Yeah, that, which which surprised me a little bit. I knew it was strong, mm -hmm. um, and Swiss is relatively small, and then American is 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 second, isn't it? So this yeah. is really amazing, and how how much one can see that. I mean the the. Um, yeah, of course, after the year 2000, a lot of companies decided to, to issue printed catalogs much more sparsely or rarely than before because uh, the internet uh, was gaining grounds and it was easy to do an online uh, auction. As you all know now, this is more the rule rather than the exception. Only special collections are, appear in the form of uh, printed catalogs, and all the rest is done online. This makes the work of somebody who is working on a dye study extremely difficult because he's got to be on his computer all day following everything that comes up for sale from small companies that only do online auctions. And this is really hard. If he misses them, some uh, don't, uh, don't, uh, they don't appear again, they uh, disappear. Some people of, of some, some companies like that, they keep their uh, records and you can go back and see the, uh, the prices and the uh, pictures of the coins. That is very useful and I wish everyone would do it, but they don't all do it because um, even today when uh, space is cheaper, they still have to have a lot of space to keep all these photographs of the past auctions because each of these auctions sometimes has over a thousand or 1500 coins to keep these images take a lot of space and space is expensive. So unless the company doesn't want to spend money on storage, then uh, we are losing information. Mm -hmm. This is um, unfortunate, but it happens. So um, what else? Um, well, we're getting a few questions um, from people and maybe they can just um, ask them because I'm sure they would be interesting. I see some from um, Walter Holt. Yeah. Walt, well, do you want to ask the question yourself? How are you? Written or oral? Well, they, they usually can. It's better if people actually um, ask their questions because it's a little difficult for us to read them all. Um, May I ask a question, please? Yes, please. Yes, yes thank you. Uh, thank you very much for doing this. And, um, you know, you sound like a real collector. And um, some of us out here are trying to do a similar thing. Started off as collectors, um, picked up price lists and auction catalogs and being pack rats, kept them all, and then slowly but surely started to get more more, more catalogs. And now my house is filled with bookshelves and catalogs, so I really can appreciate this. Um, I was particularly interested in the uh, German commercial catalogs, and in particular those of the Berlin dealer Adolf Weil. Uh, his material is very difficult to find, the Berlin Museum, they have significant holdings of the wild catalogs, but of course, all of their um, library is still stuck in Russia, and uh, fat chance of ever ever getting that back. So I'm just wondering uh, what you might have in the way of Adolf Wild catalogs. And again, thank you very much for doing this. Yeah, uh, from memory, I think uh, Pat can correct me. I think he issued. Uh, a run of uh, auction catalogs, but also, also a lot of uh, fixed price lists. Yes, you must manage your correspondence. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and we have we have a pretty pretty good run. I think. Uh, don't forget that um, when uh, an auction catalog or a list with illustrations enters a library, 
it should have at least one photograph of an ancient coin. So if we look at uh, what, uh, um, what we have out of this dealer, it may be that there are several of his auctions that are only modern or medieval, which we consciously don't want because the um, workers who do, the people who do dye studies, they're not interested in uh, yet in uh, medieval or modern dye studies. Yeah, that's interesting because while Weil's expertise was in what they called worldwide numismatics. He developed his expertise as the curator to the Jules von Robert collection. And von Robert's collection included uh, North America, South America, Asia. It was not strong in ancients. Um, yeah. He did have photographs and his fixed price list, which went by the name of numismatische correspondence, did yeah. not have any, any photographs. No. But he, pub he published uh, a newsletter, uh, Berliner Munzblatter, and there were illustrations, not always photographs, sometimes hand-drawn illustrations, um, but it was not heavy in ancients, not heavy, that's very true. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what you're saying is that most of your holdings would have been those which had photographs of particularly um, ancient coins. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, strangely enough, we like unillustrated <laughs> fixed price lists, and we have a very good run of numismatische correspondence. Yeah, yeah. ANS does but, too. They have a good run. Yeah, so. yeah. So we have, um, um, Walter Holt doesn't have a microphone, so he says here, how does the library deal with all of these many new online auctions that do not necessarily have a printed catalog or pamphlet, and then um you can answer this but ed put a comment saying that he prints them out and uh, and actually binds them which is of course one way how to deal with that isn't it yeah. um what is the actual question how one deals with the online auctions that don't have a printed ah, yeah. if you get nothing whether you print these things yeah <laughs> i we, we started printing them but then we found out it's it's really a, a colossal job and we cannot do it we cannot, we cannot fill the library with printouts of these catalogs because it's, uh, it'll, be, it'll be monstrous. The quantity would be huge. So people who are doing dye studies now are at a disadvantage because a lot of these coins appeared, they were lost, and perhaps one day they will surface again. But uh, for the moment, the um, documentation of, uh, of a particular uh, area or mint is not complete. Is not, it is not possible to be complete. Of course, many of the um, lesser coins, let's say fraction or bronzes, mm -hmm. were not illustrated in the really early catalogs either. And, you know, and, is, and that is also a problem. That yeah. is a big problem yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, in the in the before the war, before the Second World War, the illustrations were very scarce, and um, one had to rely on the descriptions. Going backwards, you see that um, uh, you don't get any weights in the descriptions yeah. either, and uh, it is completely uh, impossible to to identify coins by an early uh, German fixed price list description, because all they, all they give is uh, obverse and reverse and, uh, and a price. Yeah. So, uh, of course, uh, somehow uh, people take advantage of that. And uh, <laughs> they could say that the coin I have was in an 1898 German fixed price list. Here's the description. How can how can the authorities dispute that? I don't know. Probably won't. Right? <laughs> no. Yeah. No, it's an it's 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 an interesting thing how people also bought. You know, when you you probably were quite happy to see, aha, this is a coin of I don't know, Vasily hmm. Knidos, and you have the description and you bought it. Maybe it wasn't. It so wasn't focused on on quality because often mm -hmm. the the photos. 
are the yeah. ones the better coins and uh, yeah the, i remember yeah. very recently i was i was reading through such a, a very old um list i think it was german but i'm not sure and um that was back in the early 1900s and um the list had uh, a description of a stator of um of punti locrio punti only they called it a tetradram which is quite a common mistake anyway for some reason or other they had the weight at 18 grams 18 grams is wrong <laughs> so there's something wrong there but you it's like a puzzle you can't really you can't really solve it it could be either a forgery overweight or it could be a misprint instead of 18 grams it should be 12 grams and so on you know you you really find interesting things in these lists of no photographs that's why in the library uh, we try to keep them again it adds to this whole picture you know when you think of provenance research and everything and when you sit in a library like this and you look at these it just sheer quantity if you just do one mint or so and mm. you realize you know how much is there and also how many coins are lost you know it's sometimes i come across the studies i do i think where is this coin right so it's we were discussing that earlier how that what you get from reading these auction catalogs sometimes is these famous collections that have just disappeared they might yeah. not be very big or very named in in the this is this is really interesting yeah. in these auction catalogs yes you 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 get a lot of information from auction catalogs and lists and um, all you need to do is read them carefully and make notes um but um yeah. Yeah, there is something to be said for collecting them i i'm very fond of some some of them and uh if I could only find the time to go through them and read them and uh, discover things. Yeah. Any and more? Yes. I see, uh, Len, um, we actually were discussing earlier the rather wonderful Newman portal. Do you, do you want to say something about you, you posted a chat there? Oh, sure. Yeah. I was just, There's you know, sort of making the observation that uh, today we have you know uh wonderful resources on both the print and digital sides and you know as researchers you really kind of have to be fluent in both um there's ways to find things online and there's ways to find things in libraries so um you know con congrats to basil for the uh print library that he has and uh you know of course there's multiple efforts going on on the digital side to uh consolidate numismatic information too i think it's excellent um warren i see you have your hand up i now see and if someone else i see also kenneth friedman has his hand up he can come after that but if other people are there um please identify yourself but warren please uh, hi, hi basil i know that your active interest has made the library happen what do you have planned for uh, it in 20 or 30 years when you're no longer actively interested <laughs> Oh, well, the, the library started in the very early 60s uh, by just buying a few reference books that were useful to identify coins I bought in the flea market. And right now it's, it's developed into a monster that is um, <laughs> overflowing the space available. So what you say about um, getting rid of the library may come sooner than you think. So you you don't plan to keep the library going with a at a permanent uh, place in Athens or something. Pardon me. Well, you don't plan to keep it going. Keep yeah. going. Well, yeah, it's keep uh, it going. It, it's yes, how much harder work. Why don't the library in perpetuity and let it go on forever? That's all. Yes, well. Can. It's much harder work than you think, very hard work. And if you want to do it properly, you really spend 
all your wake up time uh, doing something that improves the, the situation we have in the library is really very, very hard work. Yes. I'd rather I'd rather go back and collect coins, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if anyone wishes to acquire a nice little library, um, <laughs> we put the email in the chat. But, um, so, uh, Kenneth, you, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you both. And uh, I have what I think is a rather foolish question, but I was wondering, uh, there are there are precious few um, equally or remotely cl close, profound and broad and deep uh, collections of catalogs and, and material uh, like the ANS, like uh, the Fitzwilliam that, um, uh, that are similar, but obviously different from your own collection, Basel. I was wondering whether there's any concordance or should I say disconcordance of who has what and who doesn't have what as to which facility one might go to? Hmm, that's interesting. Um, we had um, we we were good friends with the late uh, Buttery, Ted Buttery, and um, one day uh, Ted came here. And <laughs> I had laid this big table over there with all my duplicates, and he just bought them all. Uh, but uh, he uh, was much more ambitious in his uh, in his uh, objective because he wanted to have every catalog or every list that was issued, regardless of whether it had photographs or not, and regardless of whether it was dealing with world coins or uh, Islamic coins or any coins. And this is really uh, a task that um, shouldn't be undertaken by someone of uh, Buttery's age. It, it, it should be undertaken by somebody who is in his late teens or something like that, because you need a hell of a lot of, of work and a hell of a lot of time to, uh, to, to do uh, something that appears almost complete. As it is now, the Fitzwilliam um, is frozen since uh, uh, mm. Buttery's death unfortunately, but we do have a list of his holdings and it's uh, useful, it's useful. I, I, I'd say there's very little in, in the ancient uh, material that we don't have and he has. Uh, it's the other way around usually. We have much more than, than the Fitzwilliam has, but um, it's very much a question of um, who will take over after Ted and uh, whether the, uh, the, the, the director of the department is willing to spend the money and the, and the salary money for somebody to work hard on this, uh, on this uh, area. In fact, the and uh, so I just wrote saying that the list, so what we're talking about here, what um, there's a PDF or it's also as an HTML file that Ted kept updating. And um, Wendy Fitzwilliam about, I would say it was about a year ago. Or so they updated their website and the list disappeared. Um, and I, although one can use the PDF, I always went on the website, I immediately complained to the, um, web manager who happens to be interested in coins and said that needs to go back up. And it is actually in the archive portion of the Fitzwilliam website. And it's an incredibly useful list for anyone interested in uh, auction catalogs um, mm. downloaded because you never know how long. Um, and I can't at the moment search with this iPad, but um, I'm, I'm happy anyone um, can write to me and as we can we can um, upload the site, but it's true, mm. it's not updated anymore. Of course, the ANS catalog Dono also doesn't have many of the fixed price lists. This is something that David Hill is always working on. I don't know whether he's on the call, um, but there is actually not everything that is in the ANS is online. And so really the reality is there is no, um, 
really full list um, the battery list is really about as good as it gets yeah yeah and and of course is not updated which is uh, a great shame yeah yeah so they get all the no this is this is um is one of these things and it's it's curious how difficult it is to actually um get money for these things when yeah. there is so much um uh, uh focus on provenance research and and you yeah. know saying ovicoin has to have a provenance but um dealers um keep their own um sort of you know obviously archives usually quite well kept um but one should really have something that is more more organized and obviously i have to say i'm incredibly grateful um to the uh, Newman portal and Len um, in the whole art of what is done that so much gets scanned in because when you're somewhere that isn't let's say this library and you need to look something up um, it is really incredibly useful and we hope that maybe more of this material can be scanned. Yeah it's a question of, of money actually when, oh. when you think of it and it's it's a shame that uh, there are all kinds of organizations in Europe at least that uh, provide money for various, <laughs> how can I call them, for various um, pastimes. And I've known people who have worked uh, for years on, on vague subjects like uh, the relationship of um, today's Europe with the ancient societies or the ancient um, uh, communities of the uh, of Greece in the past, that kind of thing. I mean, they they were funded for for two or three years to produce some kind of study, um, uh, simply because the European Union thinks that anything that comes up with the European Union name should be funded. And these people were very clever. They used they used the 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 the, the expression European Union and its similarity with the um, various uh, confederacies, the Greek confederacies, in uh, in the time of uh, before before the Romans. And uh, um, if if the European Union can find a lot of money to support such objectives, I don't see why shouldn't they find some money to, to create a database uh, based on uh, old uh, catalogs. But it's too specialized, I suppose, for them. I suspect it will be up to the dealer community. It, it, uh, where there is already some aspect one could really see a possibility of scanning the ANS card file, which is like the cut out by Mint, you know, and adding that maybe into coin archives. We've had discussion before COVID about this, of scanning mm. all these cards in, but the problem with the ANS cards are really um, that they don't have the Mint written on them, you know, you have to know where you are. So it's actually, it's money is really the issue, I would agree yeah. with this. So, um, oh, I see here someone posted the Fitzwilliam archive in the chat. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. That's really useful. And let me see what else. Um, All you got to do is Google Fitzwilliam uh, coin uh, collection. Or yeah, coin and Ed puts they, also up the yeah. um, bidder here, the, the what, what we have there. So I think that's something that anyone interested in, in, um, in these auctions and these, um, I think maybe there is more hope than we think, but maybe, um, maybe, know, yeah. Um, I, I've heard that uh, um, uh, one platform has started um, um, photographing uh, the uh, pre two thousand uh, mm -hmm. catalogs, and they are uh, they are progressing slowly. But there's such a lot to do. That it I is. Mean, it is a lot of work. A lot of work. A lot of work. And we were discussing earlier when we were preparing this, you know, how the big advantage of having the physical copy is when you're searching, let's say, coin archives, you're looking not at a visual image. You're actually mm. typing in, I don't know, whatever you're interested in, Athens yeah. or Thessaly or something. Yeah. But when you're working here with the catalogs, 
you know, you, you know roughly where you're looking, you open the plate and um, you see things that are miscatalogued, misspelled, um, all sorts of things. And of course, the, the biggest joy is you discover things. And this is why it always takes so long, yeah. because at least for me, I always look at things I'm not supposed to be doing. Yeah, yeah. Do well, other well, things. I know it, what you mean. It's, yeah. it's just a lot of fun. The, the, uh, the, the accidental discovery. Yeah. <laughs> when you go through a catalog is is amazing provided you have a, a good visual memory of course yep. you say ah this one yes. <laughs> ah, yeah. there it is yes yeah all yep. kinds of things like that happen no they get all the uh... so i see we're coming i'm i'm looking at the at the end well so not quite we can still have some some um questions i need to make sure i see whether there are more uh questions in there so they're just um, people writing them in their various comments. But I think what is really interesting is um, how many people use this, this, have used the library and... Um, oh yeah, yeah. When, when uh, this, I don't know, you have, when you look at your correspondence... When, I, I, have a, I have a very good friend who, uh, who has uh, this, um, he's dead now. He had, he started and he continued this, uh, um, Elia, which is the uh, uh, acronym for uh, um, lit literary and uh, uh, historical archives. And uh, he said to me, um, I brought him here to see the library one day, not many, many years ago. And he said, you're doing a good job, but you know something? Um, you don't get any funding for that. I said, of course you don't, it's out of my pocket. You know, I, I, I spend a lot of money out of it for many reasons. He said, I would advise you to uh, ask anybody who worked in this library to write you a thank you letter. Yeah. And with these thank you letters, you never know. One day you may be able to get some funding, even if it's completely a private, private situation here. So I did, and it's very interesting and great fun to read the different letters of the different people who worked here. Some people praise the library, but some others just write what they did. <laughs> I found this and this and this and this and this and this, and uh, thank you very much for working here. And you get um, different uh, ideas about different people. Some people are very grateful, and some people take it in their stride. <laughs> Greek archaeologists, they call us one morning and they say, I'm doing a work on this and this subject. Um, um, I'll come tomorrow. <laughs> and we say, what do you mean you'll come tomorrow? Do you know how to do research on auction catalogs? Oh, no, I'll find out, they say. It's okay, you know, I'll do it. And we are very sorry to have to turn them, turn them out, to, to say, sorry, you can't. You have to go through a literary seminar to become a numismatist before you start working here. Just because you found some coins in your excavations, it doesn't mean you have the right to, to make a, a messy article about them. You have to do it correctly. And to do it correctly, you need time. Oh, I'm very busy. I, I can only come for Christmas and Easter. That that's not the way it's done. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, Basel is very strict. I remember that when I was very young, I was given the instructions. Well, no, I mean <laughs> no, it's true. <laughs> no, no, it's a very it's a very valid point. Um, it's more than um, you know that people write things. But I see there are two more hands up, Mary and Warren. So I I don't want to cut you off, um, Mary. I just was wondering, Basil, is there are there catalogs you're still looking for? You know? Sure, there are very few, very, very, very few. These are the catalogs that the companies, for some reason or other, recent catalogs, didn't send them to me or were lost in the mail. We, 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 if we start talking about the mail and the post office, it'll be another hour. So I don't want to talk about no. it. But anyway, when we realized that we were missing this catalog, and the only way to realize it is to 
discovered that you are missing a number. You got 17 and then you got 19. What happened to 18? Oh, we sent it to you, but it never arrived. Do you have any copies for me? Sorry, they're all sold out. So then you have to go to the second-hand market of auction catalogs. Thank God there is a second-hand market and look for them. And sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. That's it's often the, very recent stuff, isn't it? Yeah. I remember you were searching for one that I'm still looking <laughs> in my office for, um, that yeah. are from the last few years, in particular during COVID, it was some... Um, yeah, yeah. But Warren, Warren has another question. I know we... we uh, Basil, when you sold your collection, did you save a few favorites that you still have? Ah, uh, yeah, that was a question that I was expecting. Um, <laughs> as I was saying to Ute just before, um, one particular writer um, that only has etchings in his uh, books. Now, I'm not talking about auction catalogs, I'm talking about books. One particular writer has always uh, uh, been of great interest to me. Uh, his name is Sestini. And he has published quite a lot. And his etchings and his thinking behind coins for that time, I think it was in the 1700s, are really worth uh, analyzing and following carefully. When we come to the auction catalogs, of course, the, the great classical ones like the Pozzi and the Rusopoulos collection of Jakob Hirsch and some others are great because you can see the uh, amazing ability of these people to form a collection in a relatively short time that is uh, simply stupendous. It's, it has all the great rarities and it, it's, it's almost like a reference book for rarities. And uh, these are, uh, don't happen anymore. I, mean, I think Warren meant actually coins, whether you, isn't that true what you said? You meant whether it was actual coins? Yes, I wondered if he had kept any coins. Well, you just sold one. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> if I have kept any coins out of the, uh, out of the, out of my collection, you mean? I collected certain areas and the, uh, uh, two of these coin, two coins were recently yeah. sold at, uh, at Nomos because they were unsold at Lantz. And I'm, uh, one, one was unsold at Lantz and I'm very happy it went to the amount that it deserved because it was a lovely coin. Another one was unsold at, uh, at um, uh, Olympia and the Olympia sale in uh, Loy. And that also went quite well, more, more at the, but of course, if we take the, the dollar value then and the dollar value today, it didn't, didn't much, uh, much of a difference. And then there was another coin with a Homer portrait that went very well for some reason. People wanted it. Yeah, those are the three coins that I kept. That's it. I didn't actually keep them. They just happened to... Uh, the, the Homer coin was not part of my collecting areas. I just kept it because I liked it. But the other two were part of my collecting areas unsold. So... 20 years later or more, 25 years later, I sold them. That's Thank it. You. So, well, I think we've come to the end, to the hour, right? And um, I, I'd like to thank yeah. um, Basil. I know on behalf of all the many people here, um, we mentioned these letters of appreciation. And, you know, when you, when you read them, I have, um, Pat gave me a few um, you know, of, of these quotes. It's really the words that come out of it, what is really the completeness and, and but also um, you know, talking um, as someone who uh, lives at home with the numismatic library, but it isn't organized. And I have to say the biggest thing I mm. like is 
that everything, you know, where everything is and it's in beautiful order. And that's thanks to Pat yeah, and thanks to Basil. Yeah. And the fact that you make it available um, to people who can just yeah. come and answer questions uh, is I think is just that, that should so, be praised here more yes. than anybody else because yes, it is not it is not easy at all to uh to classify these things and uh sometimes it's uh, it's beyond me you know so i have to rely on that a lot yeah so um that. and uh, she's got the experience of course although she's a specialist in uh, insects entomologist <laughs> For some reason or other, she's uh, uh, equally equally specialist in uh, in uh, coin catalogs. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you again. On on, I know there's a number of people on the call that have been here or have corresponded in, but so I'd like to thank you both, and uh, <laughs> and I hope that. Um, you know, people have the if have the opportunity to see Basel. Or, you know, if you have questions, then. Mm -hmm. So I thank you all for um for and thank Basel for this hundredth um long table. It's amazing that there were a hundred. We weren't sure that would continue, <laughs> but it is it is always um a lot of fun. And um, I see I'm still here for a while. Maybe I can pull off another location that I can do as this seems to work from Greece. So. Hmm. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.